Hello friends, welcome. This week we are going over the last six chapters in the manual to becoming a peaceful warrior. This is intended as a training manual for embodying the ideal of a peaceful warrior. I can envision a, a world where many of us choose this pathway and we choose to live this way and engage with the world around us in this way, I think it would be world transformative. What if we had a movement where we were saying, oh, let's get it so that every third person is a peaceful warrior, is training in this sort of thing, and how that would change so many of the things we see in life and experience, the amount of violence, the amount of conflict, when there's emergency situations, the amount of people that step up to put themselves maybe at risk in order to help others. The world needs us right now. It can begin with you and with me. Let's do it. All right, we ended last time with chapter five, which was seeing our inner state of conflict and seeing how we often are the ones that create conflict around us. And these last six chapters are about developing skills that help us to really achieve that inner state of peace. When we do this, then we embody that peaceful warrior ideal. And there's a lot to cover here and I'm going to jump into it. Remember, Again, like in the last video, to put resources down in the comments. Books, websites, videos, channels, anything that you think would be valuable that would fit in within the context of the given chapter. So write chapter six, give your resource. Together we can create an awesome training manual here, but it's gonna take all of us. And today we're going over those skill areas that can help us develop that inner peace. We've already talked in the last video about some martial skills and other things that we can develop. Today, we're going to talk about developing discipline, enduring skills, awareness, fitness, and stress inoculation. Discipline. Oof. All right. We all know we live in this culture that has some highly addictive things around us. Some of these are highly addictive substances like sugar. Some of these are highly addictive mental substances, junk YouTube videos, junk media, junk news, all kinds of mental junk that is designed to pull us back again and again and again. So in the beginning of our discipline journey, we see these things something almost to be feared because they're super powerful. These are drugs that are so addictive that maybe they take things like heroin and make them seem a little mild sometimes, especially because they are culturally sanctioned. People, if you start taking heroin, are probably going to become concerned and it's going to be nipped in the bud in some way, hopefully. When you start getting addicted to video games, you start watching the news all the time and becoming more and more anxious and fearful. That's normal. You're supposed to. You're supposed to be informed. So these are sanctioned drugs. And for a moment, I'll just ask us to all ask a question of what happens when we live in a culture that has all these sanctioned drugs and what it does to us as a people. This is where discipline is vital, vital for the peaceful warrior. And as I said, when we first are starting our journey, we might be fearful of these things, but eventually we're going to see them as tools. So for instance, for me, I will try to keep up a little bit on world events and I'll watch a little bit of various news sources 
by this point in my life, I recognize how they are mostly storytelling, how they are all trying to be hyper dramatic in their own way, and how they are all accusing the opposite viewpoints of being hyper dramatic. And <laughs> it's a giant drama fest. To pick out useful information is possible, but difficult. And I recognize that it has an impact on my mind, it has an impact on my inner peace. And so I take it in low doses and I use it for training. So to develop discipline, we need to develop our willpower. To develop our willpower, we need to train our willpower properly. And the key is to every day use some from our willpower pool, but never empty out that pool. This is a little tricky. You have to know yourself and get to know yourself as you do it. But say your battle is with junk YouTube videos. I know I'm addicted to them. I sit there, I surf through them. I watch this and this and this and this. And it doesn't make me feel good. It's crappy. I wonder where the hours have gone, but I still do it anyway. All right. So there I have myself being undisciplined and just acting on autopilot. We want to get out of autopilot. First of all, recognizing you're up against some really tough stuff. Those YouTube videos, most people, I know, okay, so mine are not designed to be very flashy, right? It's going to take a special person to watch some of my videos all the way through. If I was really hyper dramatic and talked about all the terrible things that were going to happen and showed you this and this and made flashy, I could probably get more subscribers. I want the quality subscribers that I've got here. I don't want lots of subscribers. I want not quantity, but quality. So, but I'm going to say that's not super common on any media source because most people are going to do whatever they can to get you coming back because most people are running ads. As you probably know, we don't even run ads on this channel. Most people are running ads. They're going to derive revenue from more and more subscribers and more and more traffic. So here I am and I am looking at my YouTube videos and I'm feeling that draw to build my willpower. What I want to do is I want to resist just enough. So I'm doing some resisting. I'm going to say, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I really want to do this. I'm not going to do it for 10 minutes. I'm going to set a timer for 10 minutes. And after that 10 minutes, I'm going to go and I'm going to watch all the junk YouTube videos I want. What I've just done is I've used some willpower, but I haven't drained it and emptied it. And when I use some, the next day I'm going to have a little bit more. This is the secret to building up willpower. Every day, if you can exercise your willpower almost down to the bottom of the pot, if you drain it, then you're going to break and you're going to go and do the thing that you don't want to do against your own desire not to or your own will not to. And when you do that, you put some holes in your cup. You drain next day's amount that you have. So really the way to think of this is every day you have, let's say right now you have 60 milliliters of your willpower. If you can drain that down to 15, 20, then tomorrow you're going to have 62 or 63 milliliters in your reserve. And you can keep practicing that draining. If you go all the way down, instead of having 60 the next day, you're going to have 58. So it's going to take some pretty subtle manipulation of our desires and our mind state and our actions to just use enough that we're bringing it down really low. We're exercising our will, but we're not draining it completely. Very, very important. Every day, if you do this, you're going to build up more and more and more and more. And pretty soon that desire, oh gosh, I really want to watch the YouTube videos. It takes only maybe 15 willpower points to resist that. You can do it easily because now you're at 780. And that 15 points that it takes is nothing. And you have plenty to resist the next thing and the next thing.
So build up your willpower. That's building up your discipline. At some point, you might feel strong enough, if you begin this practice, to take some three-day challenges. Three-day challenges are you take something that you think you need or you feel a strong desire for. And that might be just getting on to the internet and checking out you know, the daily news. And you say, I'm not going to do that for three days. And you just don't. By now, you've built up enough willpower that it's not that difficult. But the three days, you know, even if you have a high degree of it, it's going to tend to be enough of a challenge that it's going to drain you down pretty low again. These three-day challenges, after you get a lot of willpower, are meant to drain you down low. Because when you get high, it gets more and more difficult to get yourself way down there. You have to resist all kinds of things. It might be a three-day fast. It might be three days when you are going to train really hard each day. It might be three days where you're going to go out and just have a blanket and just be in the woods for three days and three nights. It might be three days without whatever it is in your life that sucks you in. TV or your phone. All these things in our life probably that we feel drawn in by. Pick one. Do that three-day challenge. Do the three-day challenge after you have built up a significant amount. This is not to build us up in the beginning of our willpower journey. This is to build us up after we have pretty strong willpower, some pretty major discipline at our disposal. Enduring skills. These are skills, you can almost think of these as superhero skills. These are skills that are going to be really useful to people pretty much regardless of the state of the world. And in developing these skills, you make yourself more able to deal with conflict, with problems on a bigger level. So a broader level. Some real basic examples. So for me right now, I'm brushing up again on my wilderness medicine skills and doing a lot of my martial arts training again and working on my fitness really hard again, which is something that we'll talk about in a later chapter here. I'm working on brushing up on my tracking skills again, which I let slip a little bit. So those are kind of the focus areas for me right now. There's tons of skills like this that we can develop. Running, that's another one I wanna start soon because I used to be really good running shape. If you run chasing turkeys, I'd let that slip a little bit too. When I think of these as superhero skills, I'm thinking of them as skills that a lot of people right now maybe don't have and that just give you an ability to be helpful. Maybe somebody is ugh, really upset because they have this beautiful knife and, ah, and it's just, it's, they can't get a blade on it anymore. They don't know how to sharpen a knife. And you sharpen it up razor sharp for them and you teach them how to sharpen it. So that's an enduring skill that you have that you can share. Obviously, any kind of medical skills, you can think of how useful those could be. Cooking is an amazing skill to develop that can bring community and peace to people. The ability to play beautiful music. Music affects our moods, and that can be used to shift and change situations. Obviously, a lot of these skills that we talked about earlier, de-escalation skills, martial skills, the ability to run so you can go get help, you can go and get something for somebody, overcoming a fear of heights so that when somebody, a kid is trapped up in a tree, you can be the person that climbs up there and helps them out. Any place that you see yourself kind of lacking or weak, use the time that you now have from building up discipline to build up these enduring skills. Maybe before I spent an hour and a half a day 
sitting there watching junk YouTube videos. And now I'm saying, I have an hour and a half. What am I going to do with that? I'm going to take a half hour and devote to my fitness. I'm going to take a half hour and I am going to learn some emergency medicine skills. And I'm going to take a half hour and I'm going to work on a new language, which will allow me to communicate with some people that maybe don't speak English very well. Wow. Now I've taken that time that was just spent in weakening myself, in making myself smaller, less peaceful, more degraded, and I've turned it into something amazing. Awareness. This is a vital, vital, maybe the most important tool you have in your toolkit as a peaceful warrior. And awareness is not as difficult to develop as people would have us believe. As we start to use our discipline to free ourselves of a lot of the hyperstimulation of our media, we automatically start to become more aware. And if you add a meditative practice or mindfulness practice, you're just going to make it so much more powerful. Awareness is simply our ability to take the focal of our mind and put it where we want it to go. So if I'm on default, I'm basically only going to hear my mental dialogue. If I am learning awareness, I have the ability to watch my mental dialogue, to see it unfold, to not be sucked into the story. I have the ability to notice my inner state, places where I might have a little bit of tension that is telling me I'm starting to get anxious or I'm starting to get fearful or I'm starting to get frustrated. I can have awareness of my mental, emotional state so that I'm aware of, oh, there is the seed of an emotion that I know tends to lead me down a path of being really mean to the people around me. I become aware of my environment so that I am not surprised in the same way. I start to see things around me. I see conflict. If it's starting to be generated, I take notice because I'm paying attention to people's body language, their posture, their words. In the woods, obviously, awareness comes in incredibly useful. If you're a hunter, you need that awareness, that open awareness. And you've probably felt it. If you're a forager, that open awareness is going to allow you to see that and that and that and that. Awareness, wow, so powerful. Awareness also takes us out of that sympathetic, that reactionary, that sympathetic nervous system, that reactionary mode. Because when we're in awareness, we're not locked down. The Blocking down the narrowing of our mental focus or visual focus is coincident with getting into fight or flight. Awareness opens us and takes us out of that sympathetic into our parasympathetic nervous system. Ah, feels great. It is incredibly useful and life-changing. It is the entrance into the mind state of the peaceful warrior. And hey, <laughs> and that basic situational awareness that it gives us is super important when we're dealing with any kind of a conflict based situation. That's my dog friend out here visiting me. Now, recently, somebody in the comments for one of my videos was trying to convince me that I really should try psychedelics. And we had a little back and forth about it. And the conversation stopped. But I realized later on that the real reason that I have a lack, I'm going to say a complete lack of interest in psychedelics, is that kind of from the beginning of my life, I've been 
very focused on this idea of having awareness and having it operating. To take a psychedelic and be out of commission for, let's say, two or three hours, to get drunk and be out of commission for the duration of that drug in my system is just alien to me because I've had so many instances in my life where, and you probably will too, if you choose this path of the peaceful warrior, your skills will be called upon. And like somebody, a firefighter who's on call, if you're sitting there getting drunk, you're useless when you're called upon. If I am on psychedelics, not arguing about the benefits or whatever of them, whether they're mind expanding or not, but for me, if I was using a psychedelic and I was called upon, I would not be there. I would have failed the people around me. So that's why for me, it's very important to always be in awareness. In that last video, uh, last week, the first chapters, the first five chapters of this manual, I talked about the story when the, the girl came from next door who had all the lacerations and wanted me to go get her baby. And you have to go back. I'm not going to tell that story over again. But I could be there. Even though I was at a party, there's a lot of drinking going on at that party. Most of my friends were drinkers and smoked a lot of pot and enjoyed their recreational drugs. So that was fine. I have no judgment about that, and I think it was great, but I was always the person there that had awareness, that was not lost and out of it because of the intake of some sort of a substance. And that's why I was there, I was at full capacity to be able to go and get her baby. And just one of many instances when, if you remember my pig capture story long, long ago, it was just somebody a neighbor barging in my door and going, this 275 pound pig or pig, Maeve, she got loose. Can you get her? <laughs> Maybe an impossible task. And if you heard the story, it worked. It happened miraculously. But couldn't have done that if I was under the influence. As you follow this journey of a peaceful warrior, people start to see that you have many capabilities and that you have this capacity for awareness and they may depend on you. So to me, that's why this basic level of awareness of not just developing it, but making sure that I'm not imbibing substances that degrade that awareness so I can always be there. And I'm not saying you even have to be totally puritanical about this. I mean, so I drink some red wine. I am under the impression that it's good for my heart health. And almost every night I have a, you know, a little glass of red wine, and it's not much. It does not get me drunk, and I make sure whenever I drink alcohol that I do it in a way that I don't get myself non-functional. I want to be able to drive. I want to be able to go out and catch somebody's pig. I want to be able to handle an emergency next door. So it doesn't mean you can't maybe enjoy some things that are awareness affecting, but if you do it in very small amounts, so that it doesn't degrade your ability to function at full, then you're always still there and you're honoring that awareness that you've developed. Nobody's ever gonna come to you and find that you're not present for them. Fitness is pretty important. Now, fitness comes on such a wide range of levels that we all have to just be on our own journey with it. When I talk about developing fitness, I'm talking about looking at your current level of fitness. Maybe you use a wheelchair. Maybe you are severely overweight. Maybe you have some past injuries. Maybe you are an Olympic runner. Maybe whatever you are, parkour expert, whatever you are, you can bump up your fitness a little bit. And fitness also tends to be pretty uh, directed. I remember when I used to be a personal fitness trainer, we had a marathon runner come in 
and he got onto the trampoline because we would do some stuff on a trampoline and he couldn't believe how quickly he got winded. When we train physically, we often are training for that task. So you can broaden out your physical fitness and that makes you more physically able to be there, to respond to various situations. Practice climbing trees, practice running, practice swimming. Make sure you're super comfortable in the water, that you, are, you have the skills of a lifeguard. Build up your strength. A little extra strength never hurts. And again, where you are is perfect. That's fine. Honor where you are and build up from there. We can all of us look and go, oh my gosh. I can look at myself and say, I am in the crappiest shape ever if I compare myself to some people. You could equally compare yourself to other people and no matter where you are, probably be pretty grateful for the fitness that you have. But wherever you are right now, increasing in a little bit, every tiny bit that you increase makes you a little bit more able to be there present and helpful for the people around you. Okay, stress inoculation. Now, this is one that, whew, gosh, <laughs> this can be a little tricky to do because you have to be safe about stress inoculation. We talked about this back when we were talking about de-escalation because in any kind of a conflict situation, there's likely to be somebody who has a lot of aggressive energy. And it is very easy if you're on default mode, if you don't have discipline, if you haven't been training in these things, to be pulled into that aggressive mode. That energy is contagious, extremely contagious. So when we inoculate ourselves, when we get used to that kind of energy around us, I gave a couple of examples last time how you could do that. If you are sparring with somebody, you can take turns practicing with each other. So one thing to spar and laugh and have fun. Another to come in, and we would do this with students at Rewild U. I would come in and I'd start swearing at them and getting in their faces and throwing out all kinds of just really hyper aggressive energy. And ideally, they got to the point where they could just let that energy wash over them. It didn't escalate them and they could remain smooth, composed. That's when we're at our most powerful. We think we're powerful when we're enraged. And there is adrenaline that goes into our muscles and comes out and actually does give us a little bit, arguably, more strength when we're enraged. But it's only more strength and it's sloppy strength. And maybe it gives us some more temporary hit points because we get adrenaline and we can push through some pain. But if you have discipline, you can push through pain too and not be as affected. So you can gain hit points. If, you know, <laughs> if you're a role player, you know what I mean. Um, hit points being your ability to endure some damage, some hits. You can gain that through discipline as well. But the anger, when we spaz out, it, our energy, it, first of all, exhausts us quickly and it's not directed it's not skillful the really scary people the ones you won't want to mess with are not the ones that get all spazzy they're the ones that sit there very very calmly so developing that in ourselves that stress inoculation you can do it in that way you can do it just by having a friend come up to you and yell into your face and just get super aggressive with you Feel that wash over you. You get to practice then, ideally, in some kind of real life situation. So if you've done that and you want to train, when your spouse or your child or something comes in and they say something mean and goo goo goo, now this is not your time to react back. This is your time for training, to be there and just watch it and observe it and take the way of the peaceful warrior. De-escalate transform, come in with them. It's going to be a completely different situation than if we react. But if we don't learn that stress inoculation, it's going to be really tough not to do it. It's also beneficial 
to practice stress inoculation with things like cold showers, stripping down your underwear and lying down or rolling in the snow, doing polar plunges. Do all this stuff safely, but you can use cold as a great stress inoculator. You can do fasting. If you are at all still kind of sugar programmed in your body, when you fast, you're going to start to get hangry. <laughs> and that's a training method you can use if you have enough willpower in your stock to do it. You can use that to go into a place where you can feel yourself getting more reactive and see if you can de-escalate yourself and maintain that peaceful warrior attitude. All right, that is the manual, my friends. We live in a culture that celebrates, no, it worships comfort and safety. It tries to make us so ultra comfortable and so safe, and it celebrates that and puts that up on the pedestal as the most important thing in life. There's a lot of social pressure and a lot of almost hypnotic media pressure to adhere to that, to live our lives as safely as we can, to live our lives as comfortably as we can. And we're taught that that is the good life. That's what it's all about. But any of you, I bet all of you can write down in the comments, examples, any of you who have experienced some stressors, all of us, hopefully, <laughs> some stressors, some tough times in our life, these things are bad, but there's something good about them too. When people come out and they walk barefoot in the snow, and they lay down in the snow, and they feel the intensity of that situation, ah, oh, they feel alive. Sometimes in a way they've never felt before. Many of you take cold showers. I know, I hear from you. And same thing. Oh, the feeling of being so alive. The way of the peaceful warrior is not a comfortable way of living. It's not a safe way of living. It's embodied by that Marine police chief I spoke about who didn't pull his gun out at the first sign of aggression that somebody was giving. It's exemplified by that police officer I told you about in the last video who selflessly went out onto the ice to save somebody's dog so many other examples. You've done it. You've done it in your life when you have said, here's what I would want. Here's what would be good for me or safe for me. But you acted out of something higher. You acted out of something, you say, better. And when we do that, that is the way of the peaceful warrior. If we, you and me, start to embody this today, and we train in this, and we inspire others to train in it, and it starts a momentum, and people start doing this, wow! Again, I envision every third person in the world being a peaceful warrior. How would that change situations like that recent, well, depending on when you're watching this, that for me now, a couple of weeks ago, uh, when this is posted, event on Highway 95 in Virginia, when hundreds and hundreds of cars were stranded in the snow for, I think, 24 hours or more, and people running out of gas and freezing. And What if every second or third car was a person who was a peaceful warrior, who had their car equipped with things? for an emergency, had food and water and blankets and little heaty things and could go around and help the people around them. If we were interspersed throughout society like this, how could we be beneficial in that way? And how could we change the whole trajectory of our society? Because if our society keeps going on this route, 
of ever more comfortable and ever more safe, we are going to weaken ourselves so deeply that there may be no going back. There comes a point when we've degraded our immune systems, we've degraded our minds, we've degraded our bodies so fully that we're going to evolve into something else. There's a great movie, if you haven't watched it, uh, WALL-E, yeah, W-A-L-L-E. Anyway, it's an animated movie, and it kind of spells out where our trajectory is going. And it'll just keep going that way, because there's a lot of incentive to keep catering to this addictive, addictive sense of always being comfortable and always being safe. You, me, we can break free of that. We can say, I'm going to enjoy the feeling of being alive. When you're working out and you feel your lungs burning and your muscles burning, ah! When you lay back in the snow, when you spend a night out in the woods, just a blanket, it's not comfortable, but wow, you remember that experience forever. These, this is where the richness of life is. It's not in some junk YouTube video. It's not in watching whatever media personality that's spewing their latest drama, gossip, whatever. It is in experiencing life with each other. And as we do that, as we exemplify that, we spread it. So my hope is that these two videos together can serve as a manual and a guide and that at least some of you really take it and you go for it. I'm going to do it. This has been kind of my route my whole life, but I have a long ways to go too. It's another beautiful thing about this pathway. There's no ending to it. You can do this your whole life and it's skills that you can develop even when you're 98. When you're 98, maybe you're not going to be concentrating on becoming more fit, though that has happened, right? But maybe you're going to be just concentrating on being a little more peaceful in your mind. When the day comes, when it's your day to die, maybe we'll even be able to meet that with peace. Wouldn't that be marvelous? So, my friends, my fellow peaceful warriors, I hope that this serves you well and can't wait to talk with you down in the comments. Love to you all. Thank you.